Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for our, uh, I don't know what number this is, but thank you for joining us for this Lunch and Learn. Um, for those of you who have been uh, to the other uh, Illinois Environmental Council Lunch and Learns, um, this intro will be familiar, but I will read it for those uh, who haven't been to one. So um, thank you for joining us. Um, we hope that these sessions are uh, keeping our community connected during these uh, difficult times and providing a space for us to learn and, and uh, collaborate with each other. Since our founding in 1975 by a group of dedicated grassroots environmentalists, IEC has led issue advocacy campaigns by allowing environmental organizations to pool their resources and create a higher profile for environmental issues. Today, IEC represents more than 90 environmental and community organizations and nearly 400 individual members from throughout Illinois. If you're not already a member of IEC and are able to give, please consider joining today by using the link in the chat box, which we uh, shared just a moment ago. Thank you, Jen. Um, so my name is Gavin Taves. I am the Energy Policy Director for IEC, and I'm very, very excited to um, present uh, or introduce our speakers in this wonderful event that we're uh, hosting today. So today is our coal history um, and just uh, coal in general, lunch and learn in Illinois. Um, the, our short description for the event is that uh, coal has had you know, this permanent impact on the state of Illinois. Uh, this lunch and learn will cover the way that coal has influenced Illinois, um, whether that's uh, the environment or the economy um, and looking at a historical uh, trend and through, through that lens. So ranging from you know, the 1800s to uh, a modern day case study, this uh, presentation will cover everything to do with coal in Illinois. Um, and we've brought some really amazing speakers um, and experts to talk to everybody on the line about coal in the state. Um, we have Andrew Rain from Prairie Rivers Network, uh, Pam Richard from Eco Justice Collaborative, Brian Urbaszewski from Respiratory Health Association, and uh, Dulce Ortiz from Clean Power Lake County. Um, I'm going to uh, first introduce uh, Pam Richard from uh, Eco Justice Collaborative to uh, kick us off in our uh, presentation and uh, from our panel today, uh, and she will be discussing the history of coal mining. So, a quick bio for uh, Pam before we get started. Pam is the co-director of Eco Justice Collaborative, a small nonprofit in Champaign that advocates for just solutions to climate change. She co-led delegations to the coal fields of West Virginia and Illinois to expose the impacts of coal mining, burning, and disposal of waste. Subsequently, Pam helped form and co-led the Hartfield, uh, Heartland Coalfield Alliance, excuse me. Uh, this group of community representatives and environmental organizations focused on transitioning our state from coal to safe, clean, renewable energy, provided support for communities fighting coal mines, and launched a campaign for um, a coal severance tax to help downstate communities break free from their dependence on coal. She currently serves on the leadership team of the Downstate Caucus of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. Um, we're really excited to have you on the call, Pam. Uh, so with that, uh, do you wanna share your screen and uh, take it away? I do, and it's always helpful to uh, get myself off mute, right? <laughs> it's very helpful. <laughs> it's very helpful. So thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Gavin. That was great. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit earlier than you suggested with this presentation and start off in 1693. And I'm going to suggest that everybody hold on to your hats because uh, this is going to be a, a whirlwind of a presentation that covers uh, the pivotal role that Illinois has played, uh, not only in coal production, but also in the birth of our national labor, safety, and environmental laws because of our relationship with coal. So let's start right here. It was discovered, uh, well, actually coal mining and coal has, has uh, coal's been used by indigenous peoples in the US for thousands of years. Uh, but French explorers, Louis Joliet and Jacques Marquette are given the credit for its discovery along the Illinois River. Soon thereafter, Philippe Renault was sent by the uh, to Illinois by King Louis XV of France. He brought slaves from the French controlled Caribbean to extract coal and other minerals and thus began our state's dance uh, with slavery. It wasn't until 1810 that Illinois had its first commercial coal enterprise 
and William Boone is credited uh, uh, for for being uh, uh, for starting that enterprise with his indentured servant. They dug coal along the Big Muddy in Jackson County, and then they traveled by barge to New Orleans to sell it. Boone sold the barge for scrap, and then he and his servant traveled back to Illinois on horseback to begin the arduous process again, making six or more trips in just two years. Some of you may know that production of salt was the first major industry in our state. Brine collected in the Saline Springs in Gallatin County uh, was boiled down into salt, which was then used to preserve food. And by 1818, even though Illinois was legally a free state, an exemption in our constitution allowed slavery in the salt mines. And this was because they continue, contained one third of our state's annual revenue. African slaves not only worked in the salt springs, but also mined the coal that fueled the process of turning brine into salt. This was extremely hard labor that no one wanted to do. Slave trader John Crenshaw leased the salt works from the federal government and became wealthy as he produced salt for Illinois and other states. He built this mansion a few miles from his salt works near Equ Equality in Gallatin County. It's now known as the old slave house because Crenshaw was part of the reverse underground railroad. He kidnapped free blacks and he sent them back to servitude in slave states or force them to work in the salt mines. Coal mining in Illinois didn't really begin to take off as an industry uh, until the 1830s when coal mined in St. Clair County was used by blacksmiths in nearby St. Louis. And then production grew by leaps and bounds over the decades. Small towns named after coal sprung up across the landscape as people set out to make their fortunes from this natural resource. These were good times. But during the late 19th century, labor disputes were common. In 1898, a coal strike broke out in Verdon, southwest of Springfield, after the Chicago Verdon Coal Company refused to pay miners union scale wages. The strike ended with 16 people dead and 80 injured, including 50 African American strike breakers that were unknowingly brought in by the company, unknowing to them, that is. Uh, Chicago Verdon Coal ultimately granted the wage increase, and the strike in Verdon is credited with winning the eight hour workday for miners. This cemetery, the Union Miner Cemetery was established when the local church cemeteries refused to bury the bodies of seven strikers killed in the Verdon strike. Mother Jones, Union Mine Worker activist and organizer asked to be buried here with her boys because the Illinois coal fields were considered to be the birthing ground of unionism in our country. Some of you may not know, or maybe you do know, that Mary Jones was a seam, uh, Mother Jones rather, was a seamstress in Chicago before dedicating her life uh, to labor rights. So high energy coal uh, lies beneath two thirds of our state. And underground coal mining was the predominant method of coal extraction until the 1940s. This work was dangerous, dirty, and often damp. Miners working in tunnels could not stand up straight. They picked and shoveled coal, loaded it onto small cars, and then pushed those cars to an area where mules would pull them onto a cage where the coal would be hauled to the surface. Miners used lumber to prop up the tun tunnels, but often huge rocks would fall, trapping, injuring, or even killing them. Conditions were harsh and explosions and fires were common. One of the worst was the Cherry Mine disaster, which occurred in Cherry, Illinois, located northeast, northwest, northwest of LaSalle, Peru. A coal car filled with hay for mules caught fire, killing 259 men and boys. The following year, the Illinois legislature established stronger mine safety regulations and in 1911, Illinois passed a law which would become the Illinois Workmen's Compensation Act. 
Throughout this period, Illinois communities experienced the promise of good paying jobs and prosperity juxtaposed against the low wages, untenable mining conditions and the control of company towns. And once the coal was mined, companies packed up and went elsewhere, leaving once thriving communities behind. This cycle of boom and bust continues today. Strip mining began as early as 1850, but with the introduction of the steam shovel, it became less labor intensive and more cost effective than underground mining. And by the 1960s, more than half of the coal mined in Illinois was by this method. Vermilion County is said to be the birthplace of commercial surface mining and uh, was one of the first to be uh, able to start using the mechanization. By the 1970s, strip mining became the dominant method of coal mining, leaving major scars across the landscape. This 1998 aerial is of a 2,500 acre surface mine in Knox County that was stripped in the late 70s. While it's now a wildlife refuge and state park, the aerial that I just showed shows how land was left at that time after mining. Anna Johnson and Jane Johnson, who are not related, uh, worked for 30 years to protect prime farmland in Knox County from the ravages of strip mining. Along with local officials, these two women are credited with getting federal and state lawmakers to enact the Surface Mining Reclamation Control Act of 1977. This act, which exists today and, and regulates coal in, in uh, the country and, and of course in Illinois, it created two programs, one for regulating active coal mines and a second for reclaiming abandoned mine lands. Here in 1990s, we probably can remember this, many of us, amendments to the Clean Air Act caused yet another major coal bust. The sulfur content in Illinois coal is high and the new regulations which required power plants to limit their sulfur dioxide emissions were devastating for this industry. Faced with a choice between installing expensive pollution control equipment or switching to low sulfur coal mined elsewhere, power companies chose to do the latter. And the state's annual production dropped from 62 to 32 million tons and employment plummeted from nearly 10,000 workers to fewer than 3,500. By about 2008, Illinois had found reliable markets out of state. And today, 80% of the coal mined here is exported overseas and to 15 other states. Until 1960, coal in Illinois was extracted through uh, room, room and pillar uh, mining where columns of coal are left standing underground to support the surface. Today, the method of underground mining has been replaced uh, by long wall mining. Long wall mining uses a massive machine underground to grind away whole seams of coal. And as this machine advances, the ceiling is allowed to collapse behind it. This method with its planned subsidence can remove up to 90% of a coal seam with far fewer miners but it also causes widespread subsidence. Panels of earth sink by up to six feet, cracking the foundation and walls of houses, subsiding roads and farmland, and causing water to pool and depressions created as land collapses. Illinois communities do re really do not benefit from coal extraction but they bear the brunt of the impacts from mining and the waste that are left behind. The short-term economic, uh, short economic benefits from a modest number of coal jobs come with long-term health and environmental impacts that I'm going to run through right now. Logging, if the land's going to be stripped for coal extraction, then it needs to be cleared. This eliminates wildlife habitat and changes the landscape. Processing coal creates lots of dust that hangs in the air. I've driven through it and can't imagine 
what it would be like to live or have a business nearby. Before coal is transported to market, it must be washed. It needs to be separated from soil and rock. Up to 2 million gallons of water is used per day to wash and process coal at each coal processing plant. And that's an amount roughly equivalent to that which would be used by a family of four for 13 years. I've had my math checked on that one. Washing the coal releases harmful chemicals such as arsenic, cadmium, and selenium. The resulting toxic mix is stored in 50 to 100 foot tall slurry ponds that often are unlined. And when those impoundments leak, they poison groundwater, streams, and aquatic life. If the dams were to fail, consequences would be dire. Although these impoundments are dewatered as part of mine reclamation, these structures, often more than a, core, than a square mile in area, forever remain as toxic reminders of coal mine across Illinois landscapes. Acid mine drainage is created when water, oxygen, and the sulfur and coal uh, combine to produce sulfuric acid. It contaminates mined areas and has detrimental effects on streams and aquatic environments. Coal dust from transport trucks and rail coat houses and is thought to cause respiratory and other health ailments. And long wall mining subsides farmland, disrupting established draining, drainage patterns and causes pounding as discussed before. Often roads are closed during mining. And when this happens, it causes adverse travel for residents, emergency vehicles and schools. Long wall mining cracks building foundations and walls, but Communities are also affected by subsidence from room and pillar mining when the ground shifts and underground pillars collapse. This seven-year-old elementary school in Coopan County buckled so much that it had to be torn down. Residents are required to move out of their homes when their property is being long wall mined. And when damage is especially severe, they often decide not to move back in. Sometimes residents sell their property to the coal company who ultimately tears down homes. This depopulates central and southern Illinois communities. By the late 1970s, there were over 200,000 acres of abandoned mine lands in Illinois. Today, these are collected from mining companies and used to reclaim coal mines abandoned before 1977. But funds are limited and some sites are so contaminated they, never, they may never be able to be fully reclaimed. This photo shows one of the worst sites in the country that's located near Carrier Mills in Southern Illinois. High levels of acid have left 20 miles of streams and creeks devoid of any life. And black lung is on the rise due to changes in mining practices that now produce higher levels of crystalline silica which is even more damaging to lungs and coal dust. Miners don't receive benefits for black lung disease unless they are permanently disabled. And job loss. Mechanism means fewer jobs. But jobs are also lost when mines close or product, product, production slows. The last union mine in Illinois closed in 2013. And today, Companies like Murray Energy regularly lay off miners who try to organize and ask for safer working conditions or higher wages. The number of coal miners peaked in Illinois during World War I. And today, the number of miners, because of mechanization and other, other reasons mentioned before, has fallen to just over 3,000. If you are a miner, the pay is good. And despite the hardships, miners want to keep their jobs. Coal companies claim they are economic engines that fuel the prosperity of Illinois. While the industry does provide some good paying jobs, it's also a significant burden on taxpayers. Today, all the revenues generated by the industry 
uh, 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 excuse me, if they are subtracted from uh, the subsidies and the expenses, uh, results in a net loss of $20 million. So this is pretty significant. You know, the, the net impact on our state is $20 million a year. And this doesn't include the taxpayer dollars that are required to clean up after coal companies leave. Illinois is just a, one of a handful of states that does not collect a coal severance tax, a common sense excise fee on coal companies that is based on the price or the volume of coal mined. And while their natural resource wealth is being extracted and exported out of state, Illinois communities have been missing out on a revenue source that could have yielded millions of dollars each year. Here's an example. In 2016, 20% of the coal mine in, in the state came from Southern Illinois' Saline County, one county, 20%. If a 5% severance tax had been, held, had been put in place, nearly $160 million in revenues could have been collected to help this county and its communities begin to diversify and transition from coal. Okay, what's the future hold? We know renewables and natural gas are out competing coal. Federal projections show that for the first time, more electricity in this country will come from renewable sources like solar and wind than from coal. That's huge. A recent report by an energy, economics, and financial agency says that the regional coal industry in Illinois will be gone in 20 years. I really want to believe that. Communities that prepare for this trans transition, diversifying their economies and moving into a new energy economy with wind, solar, and other renewables could do well. But, as long, but because Illinois has about 15% of the nation's economically recoverable coal reserves, second only to Montana, I think Illinois will remain a key producer as long as there is demand. As recently as 2019, Illinois mines produce 7% of US total coal, and our high energy coal costs less than coal from Appalachia, also high energy. Coal mined here also has an advantage because it can be transported almost anywhere from the Mississippi River. And though globally, electricity demand dropped dramatically under the COVID-19 uh, lockdown, it is gradually recovering, bringing back markets put on hold during the pandemic. So what does the future hold for Illinois coal? Again, I really think this is important. As long as there's a demand, I think Illinois will be an important producer. But just how long that demand is remains to be seen. And in the meantime, we need to do everything we can to work together to keep coal in the ground by bolstering renewables through legislation like the Clean Energy Jobs Act and helping Illinois communities make that difficult transition from coal. The end. Amazing. Wow. Um, I'm trying to stop sharing. Hold on a second. No worries. Don't, just keep talking and I'll figure this out. I can't get my cursor up. There we go. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, Pam, thank you so much. That was the most thorough presentation I've ever seen on the history of coal. And you, you covered so much material in so little time. Yeah, that was really wonderful. I learned so much. Thank you. Hey, um, Gavin, I'm going to have to leave and come back in. I can't stop sharing. It's at okay. the top. <laughs> All right, bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Um, uh, yeah, this was, uh, that, that was great. So uh, up next, um, we're going to go from, you know, the, uh, the history of coal um, to uh, looking at some of the impacts that are, that are um, afflicting a lot of communities around our state right now with a specific look at air pollution from um, the coal power plants. So uh, with that, um, Brian Urbaszewski is gonna take this uh, next segment um, and a quick intro for uh, Brian. Uh, Brian uh, Urbaszewski is the Director of Environmental Health Programs for the Respiratory Health Association, and he's been in that position since 1998. Uh, Brian promotes clean air in Illinois and metropolitan Chicago through public advocacy and public education. Uh, he has successfully worked to enact and implement local, state, 
and national air quality policies and legislation covering coal power plant emissions, diesel and gasoline vehicle emission standards, national air quality health standards, as well as air pollution education and awareness campaigns aimed at promoting clean energy uh, and zero emission vehicles. Uh, he's a regular resource for local media on environmental health issues, and he specifically um, advocates for uh, uh, education around air pollution um, and their effects on people with asthma and COPD. Uh, we're really, really thankful to have you here, Brian, and to hear more about the impact of coal on respiratory health. So uh, with that, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, Thank, thanks, Kevin. Um, and I have to apologize in advance that I'm sure my slides are nowhere near as, as pretty as, as Pam's. Um, so apologies up front for that. Um, just so people know where my organization is coming from, we've been around for a long time, founded in 1906, and our mission is to prevent lung disease and to promote clean air and help people live better lives through education, research, and policy change. Um, so and I, I am the air pollution policy person at my organization, but we do a lot more uh, trying to prevent asthma, uh, trying to prevent chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, working on tobacco issues, etc. cetera. Um, but for us, that means fighting air pollution, uh, defending the Clean Air Act, and working to promote strategies to clean the air. So um, talking about air pollution begs the question of what is air pollution? Um, so coming up with a working definition is a little harder than you might imagine. Uh, this is one, uh, you know, the presence of a substance in the air at a concentration sufficient to interfere with the health, comfort, or safety, or with the full use and enjoyment of an area. Um, that sounds very technical and very uh, focused. However, uh, then you start thinking that includes flying rocks, sandstorms, all the way up to greenhouse gases. Um, so defining air pollution is, is a little more difficult than one would seem. Um, just to delve into a little bit of the historical background, um, you know, when, do, when does air pollution become a, uh, an issue to focus on in the American consciousness? Um, I think really you'd have to go back to 1948 uh, and an, an episode in a small town in Pennsylvania that had a big uh, zinc uh, processing facility. Um, and like a lot of small towns, it, you know, was an economic driver for that community. Um, but the problem was uh, in 1948, there was a weather situation that descended on that community and all the fumes from a large zinc processing plant that burned coal uh, to refine that zinc for steel making uh, was trapped in the valley where the town is located. Um, for several days. Uh, that picture on the bottom is a picture of around noon on one of those days uh, in 1948. Um, and while it was a small little town in the middle of Pennsylvania, this, the, um, the episode, which lasted I think about eight days, wanted kill, wanted up killing about 20 people um, immediately, uh, wound up killing them another 50 or so in the next two weeks. And there were still elevated death rates in that community decades after um, this incident occurred. Um, but the immediate shock was big enough to actually wind up in the New York Times and spread from there throughout the entire country. Another uh, type of air pollution issue sort of came to bear in the 1950s um, in Los Angeles and the Los Angeles smog epidemic. Um, and this was a little weird because for most people, un most people's understanding of air pollution, uh, that it was driven by coal um, and Los Angeles just didn't fit that, uh, that definition. Um, it was dry, um, it was out in the desert, uh, there were no coal plants or not a lot of coal being used for heat or for in industry uh, or for power generation. Um, and yet there was this eye watering and throat scorching uh, pollutant that uh, made it difficult to breathe. Uh, and because of Los Angeles's role in the national, um, you know, entertainment culture, uh, radio and TV kind of spread this um, idea of a new kind of air pollution around the country and into people's consciousness. So uh, that gets to how pollution is tracked today. Um, 
So the Clean Air Act was passed in 1970 and it defines criteria pollutants. So these are sort of the main pollutants that are governed under the Clean Air Act. Uh, there's six. Two of them, carbon monoxide and lead, are in large part um, have been dealt with. 99% uh, reductions in those areas. Other issues, other areas, uh, nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide, um, these are pollutants that are still a problem, um, but they're only a problem as measured as a direct impact on air pollution in very small areas. So there are very few areas around the country that have specific problems that the EPA has identified where they're not meeting health standards for nitrogen dioxide or sulfur dioxide. There are a few. What it comes down to is most air pollution problems around the country are now the last two of those six main criteria pollutants, particulate matter and ozone, which I'm gonna go into a little more. But those are the ones that we've had problems with over the last, uh, well, 50 years in Illinois uh, and continue to have problems with. Um, and again, EPA calls these criteria air pollutants because it regulates them by developing a health-based and or environmentally based criteria, hopefully science-based guidelines for setting permissible levels. Um, so the federal government looks at the science um, and ultimately US EPA decides where to set a standard that says, if you exceed this standard or you, you exceed this level of air pollution, you need to um, implement a process to reduce air pollution so you get below those levels, which we have deemed unhealthy. Now, I'll come back to that a little longer in, in a little while. Uh, but I also wanna touch on some other um, issues that are, that are um, air pollution related, uh, not necessarily lung related. Um, coal and burning coal remains a major source of mercury in the environment. Um, which doesn't affect people's health through breathing it, but the problem is, is that mercury winds up in the air, it rains out into waterways, lakes, uh, even in the, into the ocean, and from there it gets metabolized by um, very small animals, bacteria, uh, and winds up in fish and works its way up the food chain, concentrating uh, the entire way there. So, um, going higher up the food chain means you have animals that have more and more mercury in their tissues. Um, that has been a problem in Illinois. Uh, there's a statewide advisory for eating fish, especially for predator fish. Again, working up to the top of the food chain is where you see the highest concentrations of mercury. This has uh, concern, broad concerns about IQ uh, and abnormal muscle tone in children. Um, and the state advisory has been established to protect pregnant and nursing uh, women and fetuses, women of childbearing age and children younger than 15 years of age, uh, where there are uh, guidelines for how much fish and what kinds of fish you should eat uh, if you are concerned about your own health and the health of your children. Uh, and I just wanna note here too that um, if, if people read between the lines, and I'm sure probably about half the audience already has, uh, that means if you're a woman, don't eat fish, or you have to be concerned about this over your entire life. Um, you know, if you're a girl under age of 15, um, you should be concerned. Uh, if you're a woman of childbearing age, you should be concerned. Uh, and if you're a parent, you should be concerned. There are uh, rules that have been put in place in Illinois that are much stronger than uh, what the federal government has required and those uh, federal rules have continued to be litigated. Um, and so while Illinois coal plants have much stricter uh, controls on mercury, um, everything outside of Illinois, uh, upwind of Illinois basically has a uh, much more lax standard to um, comply with, meaning a lot of mercury is coming into Illinois. Um, Going back to the criteria air pollutants, though, the widespread um, uh, pollutants that affect lung health and breathing, um, the Chicago area has historically been an area that does not meet federal air quality standards. So has the Metro East area of St. Louis. 
Um, the other areas in between have not historically been um, uh, labeled as areas that fail to meet minimal federal air quality standards. Um, but I want to point something out here. Um, US EPA, uh, under current leadership, has not been the best in setting air quality health standards that protect people. Um, the EPA is supposed to, every five years, look at the science, decide if uh, standards that are set to protect human health need to be changed or adjusted. Um, and historically, that has almost always led to uh, the science highlighting uh, health problems that were not previously known from air caused by air pollution or uh, and or uh, identifying air pollution uh, related um, health damage at air pollution levels previously thought to not cause problems. Uh, so these processes have historically led to the EPA tightening air quality standards and saying air pollution is more dangerous than we thought at lower concentrations and therefore, we, we are tightening the limit that we deem as safe for the public to be exposed to. Um, so this year, the EPA has already uh, gone through a slipshod, uh, abbreviated way of looking at the fine particle standard and decided that it's not going to tighten that standard, despite uh, pretty substantial uh, scientific evidence that they need to do so. Uh, they have also started the process and are going to be continuing the process the rest of this year to not tighten the ozone standard as well. Um, so I want to say when we talk about areas that have air pollution problems that have been labeled as having air pollution problems, uh, that's not necessarily saying that the rest of those areas um, in Illinois are safe from air pollution. Uh, especially because of what the EPA is uh, unfortunately doing right now to uh, stymie the use of science and setting uh, clean air uh, based health policies. Um, something else I want people to know is that ozone, uh, which is the main problem we face in Illinois right now from air pollution, or at least the most widespread areas uh, that don't meet minimal federal air quality standards, is that ozone isn't directly emitted by pollution sources, including things like power plants. Um, it's a secondary pollutant, meaning we emit the ingredients that go up into the air. Um, you add strong sunlight during the summer months and you wind up with ozone at the end of a very complicated chemical process, that main culprit of the Los Angeles type smog. Um, you need two things to make smog. You need volatile organic compounds, which are largely petroleum products that would burn if you put a match to them. Uh, and you also need nitrogen oxides. Uh, nitrogen oxides are a byproduct of burning any fuel at a high temperature. Um, so it's in car exhaust, it's in truck exhaust, uh, it's a byproduct of burning gas in your home boiler or furnace, uh, industrial processes, and of course, burning a lot of coal or natural gas in a large fossil fueled power plant. And that bottom there is uh, from about a month ago, uh, some of the ozone um, levels that we um, uh, recorded in the Chicago area. Uh, you can see the widespread uh, distribution from, you know, Kankakee up into Wisconsin, over into Indiana, the entire area was um, seeing unhealthy air quality, again, because of this process of uh, that makes the high levels of ozone. Uh, what are the ozone health effects? Uh, it's a caustic gas. It burns or it oxidizes lung tissue. Uh, that causes irritation and swelling inside the body. And, you're, and the reaction is your body's attempt to repair damage that's being done. Uh, people have often uh, talked about it being a sunburn on the inside of your lungs. Um, as you can see, swelling occurring. Uh, symptoms, uh, this usually results in people having some difficulty or discomfort breathing. Uh, some people feel chest pain. Coughing is a natural response to this. Um, and it also triggers asthma attacks, leads to respiratory emergency room visits and hospital stays, again, especially for people living with lung disease. Um, and it really causes about 4,000 deaths a year across the country. Um, it also lowers... Uh, ozone also depresses the immune system's response. Uh, so you get lowered resistance to other infections as well. So you get more sickness and you get lost work in school days because of high ozone levels. Um, the other 
problem uh, that we face in Illinois is particulate matter. Uh, various examples here, uh, people usually think of particulate matter as being something a little bit more tangible and visible uh, that you can see, like the examples of smoke and diesel exhaust here. Um, but actually, most of it is something you can't see. Um, particulate matter is basically what people think of as soot particles, but it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, the telephone pole there is a human hair. The boulders are bits of sand, sand grains. And when we're talking about particulate matter, especially uh, more specifically, particulate matter less than two and a half microns, which is what the EPA um, uh, has a health standard for and which, which we do not, well, we do meet, uh, but it, which, which that standard should be a lot stronger. Uh, but when we're talking about fine particulate matter, we're talking about the small pink balls here, uh, things that would take uh, at least 50 to make the width of a human hair. They're extremely tiny. Um, and again, uh, when I talked about ozone not being something that was directly emitted from what we think of as pollution sources, vehicles, power plants, um, the same to a certain extent applies to particulate matter. Some particles are emitted directly coal ash, diesel engine soot. Uh, you can even get small particles of dirt or salt, smoke particles. Um, but most of the particles that are in the environment that we breathe are secondary particles made from gases that we emit. Um, talking nitrogen dioxide gas and sulfur dioxide gas, both of which are byproducts of burning coal. Um, will be emitted as gases from power plants, travel on the wind, connect with other uh, chemicals in the environment and make particles that then rain down, uh, especially on large um, uh, populated areas. Again, those gases can travel hundreds of miles and most of the particulate matter that we're seeing from power plants is actually that secondary particles uh, that are being formed from the gases that travel hundreds of miles and then fall far downwind. Um, when you're talking about particulate matter, uh, where does it wind up? Um, large particles often get caught in the nose and throat. Uh, so things that are somewhere between five and 10 uh, uh, wind up in, the, in mucous membranes in your nose and throat and they don't wind up in your lungs. Uh, the particles that are less than two and a half or especially less than one microns wind up in the deepest portions of your lungs, uh, the alveoli, uh, where they can actually be transferred to the bloodstream as well. So what are the health effects of particulate matter? Uh, again, the smaller the particle, the more deadly it is, the deeper it penetrates into your lungs. Um, and again, it's, it's the size of the particles is important, not necessarily the material they're made of. Um, the results you see from particles uh, in the air, more asthma attacks, more respiratory emergency room visits, hospitalizations, heart stoppages, stroke, premature deaths. Um, and the impact from fine particulate matter is uh, much more deadly than ozone. Um, so even though we uh, technically meet the EPA's lax standards for particulate matter in Illinois, uh, as does most of the country, you're still seeing tens of thousands of deaths every year across the U.S. from people breathing particulate matter, uh, which, you know, ironically says, well, maybe that particulate standard is too lax and it should be tightened and we should work on reducing particulate matter. Uh, but currently the EPA does not agree with that assessment. Um, and I also want to point out that based on the science that's out there, uh, the only point you get to zero health impacts from particulate matter the small particles is when you breathe no particulate matter. There's no magic level, at least looking at the science, um, that shows that at a certain level, those health impacts uh, ranging from asthma attacks to premature deaths cease to exist. Who's at risk? Uh, again, people living with longer heart diseases, chronic diseases, and the elderly are most at risk from health impacts. Uh, children are particularly vulnerable to the health impacts of air pollution because their lungs are still developing and this can damage them, uh, leaving them with lifelong deficits in breathing capacity. Uh, children also breathe 50% more air per pound of body weight than adults, which makes them more vulnerable. 
they are essentially filtering out twice as much air pollution, uh, you know, every day compared to an adult. Um, and in some places, we have disproportionate impacts of um, lung disease. Um, the asthma in Chicago is a huge problem, but it's especially a problem in lower income minority neighborhoods on the south and west side. Um, Chicago is an asthma epicenter. Uh, it's the number one reason for school absenteeism due to a chronic condition. Uh, and the hospitalization rate is nearly double um, in Illinois. Uh, in Chicago is double uh, the state average. Uh, in fact, if a, you are a, a black child in Chicago, you are five times as likely to wind up in a hospital emergency room for an asthma attack than if you were white. Again, some neighborhoods, over 30% of the children suffer from asthma. And again, it's overwhelmingly in minority and low income communities. Other areas, it could be less than a third of that rate. So getting back to coal-fired power plants, uh, looking at what happens when coal power plants close, and what are the health impacts of that? Um, I'm gonna rely on a report that was done by the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, almost two years ago uh, that looked at a modeling exercise. What would happen if you uh, remove the emissions coming out of those power plants? Uh, hence those emissions did not fly on the wind, did not turn into particles, uh, did not fall uh, to the ground where people can where people can breathe the, those particles and what would the health impacts be uh, and they're pretty huge um, they looked at what would happen if you retired the Waukegan and the Edwards coal-fired power plants in Illinois um, if that happened you could eliminate as many as 431 premature deaths between now and 2030 uh, and consequently uh, a lot of other uh, lesser health effects, chronic bronchitis, hospital emergency room visits, uh, asthma-related ER visits, would also, heart attacks would also be reduced. Um, they also looked at the Dynagy Vistra 6, uh, which I won't name all of them, um, but again, huge impacts, uh, nearly a thousand premature deaths over about a decade uh, that would be avoided if the emissions from those uh, were eliminated. Um, and I should say that four of those Dynadry Vistra six, I believe, uh, possibly five at this point, uh, have been closed. And so when you're looking at, you know, what is the health impact of getting rid of coal plants, here are, you know, approximate numbers for what you would see in terms of those health benefits. Um, beyond the direct lung health impacts of air pollution, uh, we also have the problem of global warming. Uh, which everybody knows, and coal-fired power plants being a huge source of global warming emissions, um, it is getting hotter. Uh, there's no denying that temperature is going up. Um, this is from a uh, University of Wisconsin uh, research group that I've been talking with over the past several months. Recent data, power plants are still a huge source of carbon dioxide in Illinois. Um, and in fact, when you look at coal, even compared to natural gas, it's two and a half times as much CO2 is emitted uh, in generating a kilowatt of power from coal compared to natural gas. Not to say natural gas is faultless, but just for scope when we're talking about coal fire power plants compared to other sources. Um, basically, if we were able to pass a bill like the Clean Energy Jobs Act in Illinois, we would eliminate nearly a third of the emissions driving global warming uh, within 10 years. Um, Everybody knows uh, that as our climate change changes, we're going to get warmer. Uh, this is from a US, climate, uh, US global climate change report several years ago, but looking at basically what Illinois' climate would look like as we progress towards mid-century uh, and whether we, uh, whether we uh, cut emissions a lot or, 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 or don't, uh, either way, we're gonna get warmer. And how warm is kind of an open question, um, but just for uh, people's perspective, talking about Northwest Arkansas and some of the temperatures that were seen there uh, a few years ago, uh, you can sort of see where the metropolitan Chicago region is that has most of the state's population, uh, what could occur going forward. Um, not only does uh, global warming present huge health and economic uh, and equity challenges going forward, uh, but it actually has an iterative effect on air pollution issues. 
So when we look at the ozone smog problem, uh, which again, there are several areas in Illinois, and most people in Illinois, in Illinois live in areas that don't meet federal air quality health standards for ozone right now. Uh, and the fact that ozone is made and not directly emitted um, has an impact here. Uh, the warmer the temperature gets, the faster the chemical reaction that makes ozone runs. And so you get higher levels of, with warmer weather, you get more ozone, essentially. Um, as these charts show, uh, as the temperature goes up, you get that increase, um, you know, whether you're in Atlanta or New York, or Chicago or St. Louis, Metro East, you're going to see more air pollution. So um, even as we uh, reduce the ingredients uh, that make ozone smog by uh, getting rid of power plants or putting controls on automobiles or moving towards transportation electrification, um, even as the amount of ingredients uh, going up into the air goes down, temperature increases will push the reaction in the opposite direction meaning we're gonna have a long-term problem in controlling ozone smog levels because of what global warming is doing. Ryan, okay. I am so sorry to interrupt you. We may need to close this section out relatively soon so we have enough time for other folks. Okay, and then just again to go, um, I think I have one or two more slides here. Just, you know, everybody knows some of the health effects from um, global warming that are in addition to the air pollution, uh, you know, the droughts, the wildfires, the flooding, uh, the heat stress um, and, and deaths that would occur from that. Uh, and then just to finish up, you know, <laughs> going to clean renewable energy and energy efficiency, it's just good for public health. We get clean air, people save money, uh, you get uh, long-term sustainable transportation options and people live better lives. So I'll end there. Awesome, thanks so much, Brian. Apologies for that uh, interruption. Um, so, that was wonderful. Um, so now we've kind of gone from uh, the history of coal in Illinois, looking at the local impacts uh, in, in, from mining on uh, land, looking at stripping, and then we've moved to uh, air pollution. And now we're gonna look at the impacts of coal on Illinois water. So with that, um, I'm gonna introduce Andrew Rain from the Prairie Rivers Network. Uh, Andrew has worked at Prairie Rivers Network uh, located in Champaign, Illinois for five years. Uh, his work is focused on preventing pollution from coal ash, which is a byproduct of burning coal, which you will no doubt uh, talk about, and moving Illinois toward a just transition future um, and moving away from a dirty energy economy. He has a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Illinois. So with that, Andrew, I'm going to let you take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Gavin. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get through these things pretty quick. Um, I think I feel like I've talked about the coal ash issue a lot, but, uh, you know, maybe it'll be new to some folks. Um, so what you're looking at here is a picture of the Wood River power plant. And what you see is the power plant uh, on the right near the Mississippi River. Um, but what you'll also see nearby every single power plant is coal ash ponds. And ponds might be a misnomer here. They're not always wet. But uh, this is a zoom in on the East Ash Pond at the, the Wood River Power Plant. And you can see the wet area where there is currently water on that power plant, but actually, or on that coal ash, but actually that whole sort of bermed area, uh, including sort of the, the, the black um, coal ash uh, north of the, or past the, the water is, is coal ash. So this whole thing is the pond. And, and just to go back briefly, on the other side, there are also ponds that have grass growing on them. Um, and these are at every single power plant. Here's Edwards in Bartonville, south of Peoria. Here's the, the Vermilion Power Station. Um, so coal ash is this byproduct that you get left over when you burn coal. And it's the, one of the, one, probably the biggest water threat that comes out of coal-fired power plants. Um, so what is coal ash? Uh, it, looks a lot like this. This is a picture of the uh, cleanup after the Kingston uh, coal ash spill. Um, it's the, the sort of similar to what you'd have at a, camp, a campfire, but um, what comes from coal when you burn it. Um, and it concentrates some dangerous chemicals that are inside coal. Um, so here are just a couple that you can find inside coal ash, arsenic, mercury, lead, and chromium. Um, these are uh, just sort of a few of the whole variety that you can find. Um, Earth Justice has a great graphic uh, available on uh, coal ash, or earthjustice.com slash coal ash man. And you can see there's 27 different chemicals here that you can find in coal ash in this list, you know, where and how they affect uh, you. So I recommend checking out this graphic to understand um, 
sort of how the, this can, the many ways it can affect the human body. Um, so what is a coal ash pond really quick? Uh, what it's important to know is that there's groundwater below us almost universally, uh, dig down and far enough and you'll hit groundwater. It's part of the natural water system. It connects to surface water pathways and it also is a way that water is stored below us. Um, so we imagine we wanna build a coal ash pond. We might dig a pit, put some berms around it. It might have a liner. More likely it won't have a liner. Um, and then we start running our power plant and we start filling it with coal ash. So we have this, this um, we're sluicing coal ash into our coal ash pond. Um, there's water piled on top of it, and that water flows through the coal ash and leaches into the groundwater table. Um, and again, often not lined, and so there really is nothing preventing this water from flowing through the ash and into the groundwater. And all those chemicals I listed leach into that water and end up in the groundwater. Um, and as you saw in those images I shared earlier, these things are all next to rivers and lakes. The Power plants are built uh, needing cooling water and therefore they're always built next to rivers. Sometimes they build a lake and then they build it next to the lake that they just built. Um, but they're always next to water, surface water bodies. Um, and oftentimes coal ash can pollute that surface water body. This is an image of water near the Vermilion power station. Um, and here there are seeps upstream of this image uh, that seep this nasty orange water, which is oxidized iron, one of many chemicals that you find in the water. Um, into that water and it pools here. And you can even see some orange staining on the riverbank there. And it also gets into the groundwater as I noted before, just showing here how uh, at the Edwards power plant, you could have coal ash leaching into the groundwater and this, this imaginary stream of the groundwater moves towards the, the river itself, um, showing the, the connection here. Um, this is a, a statewide issue. Uh, we have coal-fired power plants across the state. This is a little bit of an older graphic. Some of these power plants have closed, but you can see many along the Illinois River, along the Mississippi River, scattered throughout the state next to uh, lakes that we've made for, for cooling these power plants or for other reasons. Um, we did a report uh, just two years ago now um, that looked at uh, these power plants and found that 22 of the 24 uh, are leaching pollution into the groundwater. Um, this is based on data that the power plants themselves are collecting. We just sort of put it all in one spot and released a report. Uh, check out IllinoisCoalAsh.org to, uh, to find out more. Um, and again, we also found that most of these ponds are unlined. Um, so we did something about it last year. Um, uh, well, Senator Scott Bennett and Representative Carol Ammons worked together to pass the uh, Coal Ash Pollution Prevention Act. Um, this was a huge coalition effort. Lots of people worked together on this bill to make it happen. Lots of grassroots voices, uh, lots of environmental advocates. Uh, our legislative champions were incredible. Um, and this started something called a rulemaking process in Illinois. And, and that's actually where we are now. Uh, we're developing rules. Uh, the development of those rules will end in March 2021. So we're in the middle of it. Um, and the rules will specify how Illinois EPA has to regulate coal ash. It's important that we get the rulemaking right. We had a good bill, it has good language in it, but these rules, you know, the devil's in the details and we need to get those rules right to make sure that that language, uh, that the good bill becomes good rules. Um, there is an upcoming public hearing and if you all feel uh, excited to join or wanna learn more, you can go to prairierivers.org slash hearing uh, and you can find out more about that public hearing that's coming up. Well, it's a, a hearing there's a public participation component. Um, and we've been fighting for a long time uh, for uh, the principles of what we wanna see in coal ash protection. Um, and we really boil them down to a few things, uh, permanent protection, a voice and a guarantee. Um, we wanna make sure that the standards are, are put in place such that we do not have to worry about coal ash in the future, that we are getting a permanent solution that does not leave pollution behind uh, to be dealt with and to become a problem later on. Um, we're looking for a voice so that uh, people have a, a voice in the process so that it's not just something happening between the regulator and the industry. And we're looking for a financial guarantee so that we know that these companies aren't going to go out of business and disappear and not be able to clean up uh, their, their burdens. So um, that is the lightning round version of uh, coal ash. And you'll hear from me again uh, a little bit later. Wow, that was very impressive. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for um, all that inform information in such a short amount of time. That was uh, much appreciated. Um, so now going through our arc of the presentation, you know, we've done history, land, air, water impact of coal. And uh, now we're gonna talk about um, a local story um, in Illinois um, regarding the impact that coal has on communities, especially 
uh, black and brown communities um, across the state and, um, and uh, the disproportionate impact that coal has um, on many uh, of our neighbors. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Dulce Ortiz. Uh, Dulce is the co-leader of Clean Power Lake County, which is a community-driven coalition committed to local action to secure environmental, economic, and racial justice in Lake County. Dulce is also the executive director at Mano a Mano uh, Family Resource Center, which empowers immigrants and their families to become full participants in their community. So Dulce, uh, with that, you can unmute yourself and um, let you take it away. Thank you so much, Gavin. So I don't have any slide presentations. Um, I thought that I would just, you know, speak from my own personal experience and how I became involved in this work. Um, I really want to thank our co uh, my colleagues for doing such an amazing job in explaining, you know, how um, communities that have coal plants um, have the short end of the stick and all of the um, impacts that we have to deal with as uh, residents. And so I live in Waukegan. Um, I actually live um, about a mile and a half away from the coal plant. Um, it's located on our lakefront. Um, we have a very beautiful lakefront um, and it's just really sad to see this monstrosity there. But I think it's even um, more sad and disappointing that um, here we are in the year 2020 and we have you know community um communities that are still um suffering through this and you know being um just having devastating effects on what a coal plant means to be in in our communities um as gavin stated um we're an environmental justice community um the majority are uh, latinos and african americans and um you know, when, when you take into consideration the presentations that have come before me and um, everything that has been said about how this is just really bad um, for, for not only our environment, but also for um, human beings, um, well, this is what we're dealing with. Um, in addition to everything else that we have going on in the world today. And so I'm very proud that, um, I am part of Clean Power Lake County. Uh, we've been in existence for um, six years, and I want to thank Brian Yu for um, being one of the first um, members of CPLC um, and bringing us the resources and support that we needed um, to start this campaign off the ground. Um, it has been um, a journey, to say the least. Um, we have fought really hard as community residents uh, for a just transition. Um, our families here are pretty much, even before COVID-19, we're on survival mode. Um, we have low, paying, uh, low wage paying jobs. Um, we have um, community residents that unfortunately um, don't have access to um, any healthcare, quality healthcare. Um, we have um, lack of resources. And so this compounded with all the toxins that come out of the coal plant, um, you know, it's really absolutely devastating. Um, so Clean Power Lake County, you know, we uh, came together as community residents um, to let our um, leaders and elected officials know that this is something that we definitely didn't want in our community. Um, it has been a struggle, um, but we are very grateful that uh, being part of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, along with many organizations here, uh, we've been able to, you know, um, shift our strategy and um, focus more on state level work, um, state level policy work, um, instead of local, because um, we tried local for um, five years and unfortunately, um, nothing happened on that end. Um, um, it's really more hurtful too that we as residents are continue to subsidize the existence of this coal plant. Um, even though this coal plant um, sells their energy outside of our community, we're the ones that are left again with um, the health impacts. Um, we're the ones that are left with um, the um, lack of economic uh, development um, because you're not going to find any businesses 
um, you're not going to find any investors that are going to want to um, invest in, you know, close proximity to a coal plant. Um, even less have family members that, or have families that want to move into our communities, right? Um, and so we have been advocating for a just transition, um, again, for the workers, but also for our communities. Um, we have seen um, how um, our community has been affected um, because of the coal plant. And so we look at our sister organization, El Vejo in Chicago, and we're taking notes and learning from them um, as they were successful in the closing of um, the coal plant there. We know that the, um, that's not the end of the story, right? We know that there's a lot of work to be done in regards to having community agreements so that we as community residents um, have a say in what we wanna have in our community and in that space and not have another you know toxic industry come into our community and set up shop um so those are things that you know that we have been working on um i do want to touch in in regards to um what's happening in our communities with covid 19 as we know that um, inequalities exist in our communities um, as i mentioned to you um, we have um health impacts. So for example, I myself suffer from asthma. My mom suffers from asthma. Um, we have a lot of community members that don't have health insurance. And so um, for them to even be able to afford an inhaler, they have to pay approximately $300 out of pocket. Um, and right now, these families have been left with no jobs. Um, some of them have been left with no resources from the state or federal government um, where they're not eligible for any type of assistance. And so we know um, back in 2016, Brian, you please correct me um, if it's the right um, date, but um, we had a study done with the Lake County Health Department and other partners where it stated that one out of three children here in Waukegan suffer from, for, suffer from asthma or asthma-like symptoms. I would venture out to say that that number might have probably increased. Um, and again, it's because you know most of our families here don't have the um, access to quality um, health care or the health literacy needed to manage um, asthma symptoms. And so when, when you think about that, and when you think about um, what's going on in the world today, where people have been left unemployed, they have to make decisions about buying, you know, groceries or buying medication, you know, which one, which one are they gonna pick? You know, it's a, it's a very difficult situation to put our families through. That's why I think it's um, super important that on the state level, you know, we take into consideration the voices of environmental justice communities and um, talk about the inequities that exist and talk about how this, um, you know, everything is just compounded um, on black and brown communities to have to deal with, you know, not only the um, disparities on, on health, but also the uh, disparities um, now COVID-19, the disparities in regards to education, disparities in the criminal justice system. And so it can get very, very overwhelming, um, especially when you have, you know, um, a coal plant that has a uh, big influence over our elected officials. And um, we as community residents are, you know, continue to try far, fight hard um, you know, against um, NRG, um, which is the owner of the coal plant here, um, but, you know, not seeing any progress on the local level can be, um, you know, uh, pretty discouraging, but that's why it's super important for us, you know, with the passage of uh, FIJA, Future Energy Jobs Act, and also now working on the passage of CJA, um, it's, or FIJA 2.0, um, it's something that um, we're advocating because we need um, to bring in jobs into our community. We need to have our residents um, get those jobs, not have people outside of our communities come and do those you know, solar projects. Um, so 
when, when you provide, you know, good paying jobs to families, it lessens the burden of having to make difficult decisions of you're going to buy food for your family or are you going to buy prescriptions, right? Um, it also um, helps in many other levels when it comes to our schools, you know, the tax revenue. Um, we have um, more families that want to become, you know, part of our communities um, because they're not um, looking to uh, have good jobs outside of their communities. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're, we're, we also were um, um, very uh, glad to be part of the coal ash uh, bill, uh, that piece of legislation, because now it makes um, these companies clean up after themselves and not leave all that mess and all those toxins. Uh, for um, communities, environmental justice communities, taxpayers to clean up their mess, right? We have to have accountability. Uh, we have to make them accountable for um, the destruction, destruction of our environment. So for me, you know, on a personal level, um, the state work has been um, a ray of hope, um, especially with um, the administration that we have right now at this moment. Um, not only have they been, um, you know, just uh, super anti-environment, but they've been also super anti-immigrant, and we feel like we're fighting at all fronts, and I think on the state level, we have been very um, lucky and very blessed that we have been able to pass some legislation to provide these protections that the uh, federal government has taken away from us, and, you know, that we continue still to still to fight the IEPA and EPA um, in regards to the protections that they're rolling back. Um, we as community members feel unprotected and rolling back those protections, I mean, you can just imagine, you know, how that makes us feel. So Gavin, I'm not sure where we are on time, so I just want to be respectful of everybody's time, but um, just wanted to reiterate, you know, when you take into consideration black and brown communities and just the, um, the impact that it, it, it has had on us, especially with COVID-19 and exacerbating all the inequalities that existed um, prior, um, it, it just makes things a lot harder, a lot more difficult. And uh, for our community members, it's really hard to ask for them to think about the environment when there's other priorities, um, such as continuing to have a house, a household, a home, um, continuing to uh, be able to pay their electric and gas bill. Um, although there have been protections by the state, we have to take into consideration that, you know, some of our community members um, don't have the knowledge or have the time to um, do research as to, your landlord it can't kick you out because there's a moratorium, right? Um, and and it's just um, just a lot of inequities that exist uh, today. And so um, we truly believe um, that a just transition from the coal plant will alleviate a lot of uh, the impacts, negative impacts that our communities have had. Uh, we truly believe that you know we can redevelop the lakefront. We truly believe that we can bring more economic development, more good jobs, um, clean, renewable jobs. Right? Um, we want to make sure that we don't have any more um, dirty fossil fuels um, here in our communities, and therefore, you know, have a more thriving community, um, have a community that has a say as to what they want. Um, or what they envision uh, for not only themselves, but, you know, hopefully for their children. And um, there's a lot of social justice issues that I can go on and on and on. Um, but I just want to make sure that, you know, the, the, key, the key words that you stay with is cumulative impact, right? It's just um, things that um, are compounded and, um, you know, it's just... Uh, very unfair to have to put community um, members through um, all sorts of injustices um, just because we're trying to make a bug out of cold, which, you know, um, as Pam stated, it's on its way out. We all know that. And, you know, it does cause some frustration as to why aren't we moving fast enough on this. So just
just want to thank you all for giving me the time to provide a voice to our EJ communities. And thank you so much to all of you that have worked really hard on passing legislation on the state level um, and for being allies. So thank you. Thank you, Tulsa. Um, yeah, much appreciated. I, I want to especially thank you for grounding the presentation um, in some really important truths about the intersectionality of environmental justice, economic justice, health justice, and racial justice, and how, you know, coal and burning fossil fuel, you know, that's not just an environmental issue. You know, it's, it touches everything um, in all of our communities and it disproportionately impacts people of color. Um, and so thank you for sharing your story um, and uh, yeah, and providing that narrative. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, so moving to um, another, the, our last segment here, um, we are, uh, we're, we're now gonna look at um, some of the solutions to uh, the problems that we've um, illuminated in this uh, conversation. So uh, just very quickly, uh, Andrew Rain is now going to be taking um, over and talking about uh, the just transition uh, and some of the, uh, the ways that we can move beyond coal uh, in Illinois and beyond. Okay, so I'll let you go now, Andrew. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, Dulce, for that uh, talk. That was really helpful. And I think, um, I think thanks to everybody for framing uh, what I'm about to talk about so well. I think um, the 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 need for a just transition, I think, has already been been spelled out by what you've heard today. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, a way that we could achieve that in Illinois. So um, coal generation is declining. Uh, I think that uh, you heard about that from Brian. Um, we know that a number of coal plants have closed uh, just last year. There were four that were shuttered uh, last summer. Um, so we see the direction that's going on. And in some ways, Illinois is decarbonizing and it's going to happen, but it's gonna happen slowly uh, and it's not gonna happen equitably um, if we just let it happen the way it's going. So folks are losing jobs. Communities are completely unsupported when, when the coal plant closes, they're sort of put into free fall. Um, so we can do better. Uh, and um, so what I want to talk about is a just transition. And this is just one way that you might define just transition, um, looking at uh, sort of a process by which a community um, can, can find uh, what's next uh, and be supported in, in that process of uh, moving on to, to what's next um, from, from sort of going from the dirty energy economy um, to something new, whether that be the clean energy economy or uh, something else that works for that community um, and making sure that there's community agency in that process. Um, CJA is uh, the policy that uh, many folks on this call have been working on, um, many folks across the state have worked on to really uh, make that happen. Um, this, the CJA itself um, has been uh, put together by uh, community dialogues happening across the state, hearing from people, understanding um, what they need and what they think a just transition looks like, um, looking to other policies in other states to figure out how they've approached it. Um, and honestly, through, through hours and hours and hours and hours of deliberation and phone calls, um, we've put together what I think is a, a, good, um, a good shot at a just transition for communities in Illinois. Um, and as I go into this conversation, I just want to note that this is just one small part of CJA, which is a, a tapestry of, uh, of policies that, that will hopefully bring Illinois to a clean energy future. Um, and I'm really just going to be narrowing in on the just transition part. So just know that. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, equitable decarbonization. Um, and, and this is really a key part of a just transition. We can't do this right if we're not thinking about how we move away from uh, the, the dirty coal economy and how we um, do that intentionally in a way that, that recognizes um, the burdens that have been, been dealt by communities like Dulce's and other environmental justice communities uh, across the state. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to say, and I, I mentioned it already, is that you know, if we just left this to market forces, we would experience a slow and inequitable decarbonization in Illinois. These power plants, we know the trajectory. They're, they're going, they're slowly going to all shut down. Um, those communities are all going to be uh, left without those jobs that they've relied on. Um, the communities that have the power plants that are the dirtiest, therefore the cheapest, uh, will close last. And so we'll see, like, we'll see the Waukegan power plant. It will close last if we just let this be handled by the market. And um, we won't do anything to meet our, our, 
our, our contribution to meeting that 1.5, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, if, we're not, if we're not committed to doing that, or we, we have to do something now if we wanna, if we wanna hit that target. Um, so Clean Energy Jobs Act would move Illinois to 100% carbon free uh, by 2030. And we would do this through, um, through basically putting, putting caps on every power plant of how much they can emit and ramping those, those caps down. Um, and the power sector alone, uh, if we, as, as Brian mentioned, if we, if we cut out all those emissions, we get 75% of the way towards what we need to cut out in order to meet our climate target, our, to, in order to meet Illinois' contribution to get to that 1.5. We get there almost 75% of the way just by, just by decarbonizing. Um, so this is what CJU would do. Um, it does it through a stakeholder-based rulemaking process uh, that is guided by an equity analysis uh, that gives uh, environmental justice communities a chance uh, to be at the table, uh, to, to contribute to, in the, to the public process so that their voices can be heard. Um, but it also puts some guidelines on an equity analysis that needs to be, that needs to be part of that rulemaking um, so that we are able to, to agree on a shared set of principles, identifying impacts uh, uh, it, to these communities and, uh, and identifying which power plants need to uh, be closed first. Um, so like I said, it would be implemented through declining caps determined through this equity process. Um, and that equity process looks at, you know, who's impacted, what are they impacted by, how many people live there, really trying to assess where is the, where is the damage by coal been, been done and how do, we, how do we make up for that. Um, and when I said coal, this would also affect uh, uh, all fossil fuels would be closed. So natural gas as well. Um, so we have uh, the second the half is the just transition policy. What are we doing to support these communities, um, largely economically, in order to uh, move away from coal? And what we've done with CJA is really looked at three different uh, pieces. There's um, workers. How are we supporting workers in this transition? How are we supporting communities in the transition? And how are we supporting local economies? Um, and I'm going to go into each of these pieces. So um, for workers in CJA, we've put together something we call the Displaced Energy Workers Bill of Rights. Um, and this provides a number of benefits, uh, one of which is two years advance notice on all closures. Um, and if we, by that rulemaking process in which we decarbonize, we would know uh, the, the entire schedule pretty quickly. So two years advance notice would be achievable. Um, this might get tricky if power plants decide to close early or on their own. Um, but the DCO would be, would be committed to providing at least two years advance notice if they can to, um, to workers. Uh, also, uh, we're tasking, DCO is who we're tasking with a lot of this, uh, Department of Commerce and uh, Economic Opportunity. Um, we're tasking them with um, providing, uh, supporting employees with employment information, uh, letting them know what else, you know, what other jobs might be available. Um, we're requiring the companies to provide health uh, insurance, at least guarantee a year of health insurance past uh, the closure date and, uh, and protections for the retirement accounts. Also directly to the employees, um, we're gonna be providing career planning assistance, uh, helping them find out what they wanna do next. Um, financial and retirement planning assistance, so making sure that they're looking, thinking about the money, finding ways to help them think about money so that they know what does make sense for them financially. Uh, crucially, we're providing scholarships uh, this would include four years to a pub Illinois public university or community college or a trade school or a, a union program. Um, so, you know, actually letting them pursue the career they want. Uh, sometimes we hear, oh, you're just, you just want to support the clean energy. Oh, you know, maybe I don't want to do clean energy economy. Well, this is, our, this is their chance to do whatever they'd like to do. Uh, there will be opportunities in the clean energy economy through CJA, but this gives a lot of other opportunities. Um, hiring tax credits for employees who take on displaced workers. So those employees will become more appealing to, um, to employers uh, who will get hiring credits. Um, for communities, we're designating uh, communities with closed uh, either coal fire or coal power plants, sorry, fossil fuel power plants or coal mines uh, or nuclear, well, nuclear plants in some cases, uh, clean energy empowerment zones. And what that means is that they uh, are eligible for some benefits uh, for the area around them being a clean energy empowerment zone. One of the biggest ones is property tax replacement. Um, when you're running a community, when you're the local government, we've talked to mayors who have said this is so important. Uh, property tax suddenly goes away when the power plant closes and you don't have time to plan for that transition. We're providing up to five years of property tax replacement, the money that they would have been getting from uh, property tax, they get, will we'll provide that to them so that they can transition to a new normal. If that means shrinking government, 
then they're able to shrink that government over five years instead of over two months. Um, if that means finding out other ways, drawing new business that can replace that property tax revenue, it gives them the time to do that as well. Um, we're also supporting them with all different kinds of uh, sort of transition planning that bring in local stakeholders so that this isn't a top-down effort, that there's community involvement in it. Um, lastly, we're providing uh, support for economic op local economies um, through uh, basically staff that can help these communities find uh, public and private partnerships, uh, negotiate with businesses, uh, outreach to other to the private sector to attract investments in these communities, just having those staffers on hand so that the local community, which might not be able to staff something like that, gets support. And also providing tax credits to renewable energy projects uh, and businesses that will locate in clean energy empowerment zones so that we're taking advantage of the clean energy empowerment or the clean energy economy that we're going to be boosting with CJA. Um, and that's just a quick overview of the policies. Uh, the we're funding it uh, when we went around and listened to, to folks across the state about how we should do this we heard that polluters should pay and that's how we're going to be funding our our just transition so we create the energy community reinvestment fund and that's that's funded with two two uh, pathways one is a pollutant fee on anybody burning fossil fuels and another is a coal severance fee uh, on every ton of coal mined. Um, and you heard a little bit about coal severance fee from Pam and Big Credit Eco Justice Collaborative for all the work they did uh, making, starting that campaign years ago and making it something that was on the table. Um, and a pollutant fee would be a, a fee assessed on, on people burning fossil fuels. And uh, importantly, this money goes to not just the programs I just talked about, but also some major equity components uh, in other parts of the bill called the Workforce Hubs and Contractor Incubators. Um, and these are programs that are designed to help disadvantaged communities, uh, help folks from disadvantaged communities really jumpstart into the clean energy economy. Um, and so this, funds, this will fund all of that. Uh, the pollution fee is uh, essentially we look at the, the amount of money we need to pay for transition and we're going to make the polluters, uh, the fossil fuel burners pay for it based on how much they pollute. So, um, you know, nobody gets away with polluting more. If you're polluting more, you end up paying more because of this fee that, that um, is, is uh, going to cover the cost of just transition. Uh, and this fee is actually kind of determined based on how much we pull in from the other fee, which is the coal severance fee. We're looking at a flat 6% on coal uh, every coal ton of coal mined. Um, so we pull in money from the coal severance fee and we make up the difference with the pollution fee. And, um, and that way polluters will pay for the just transition. Um, our budget, uh, it looks at like something like 210 million annually. Um, and that's sort of more of a revenue target for how much money we need to bring in to fund a just transition. The reality is that if we're, fu if we're funding this based on polluters, our funding source goes away. We're actually shutting them down with our equitable decarbonization. So uh, we need to be pulling in this much money uh, in order to make sure that we have enough money to fund the entire transition, which will go on past when polluters are all closed down in 2030. Or for example, five years of property tax replacement has to continue uh, into 2035 at a, at a minimum. Um, funding those workforce hubs that are going to be 16 of them located across the state and, and the contractor incubator programs, um, up to 100 million for property tax offsets, although that is really just a peak value in case they all close in one year. Um, tax credit replacements, funding to support these programs, funding to, to send people to schools. Um, all of that is, is, is covered in this budget. And initially it's gonna be roughly half from the coal severance tax and half from the pollutant fee. That's a pretty rough estimate though. It really, it's gonna depend on production and all kinds of things. And that's it, that's all I got. So um, I hope that's kind of a quick look at what CJA does uh, to provide a just transition for Illinois communities as a way to, to close this narrative of, of, of this coal era that Pam opened our, our dialogue on. Awesome. Um, Thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, that was uh, really informative. Um, and yeah, so thank you all for really, you know, going through our journey here through uh, the history of coal all the way to the uh, solutions to moving beyond coal. Um, that was great. I learned a, a lot, certainly, and um, we're really, really thankful for um, all of the presenters and um, uh, thankful for our partners at Prairie Rivers Network for um, co-branding with this event and, and helping us with the, uh, the promotion. It's much appreciated. Uh, and yeah, so thank you all for joining. Um, this uh, is not the last Lunch and Learn uh, that we are hosting. So please stay tuned and go to 
uh, the IEC website, uh, illenviro.org, to find out um, what the other uh, series are um, that, that we're going to be hosting. Um, there are going to be more, and they are definitely going to be interesting. So uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and please email me at gtaves at illenviro.org. It's in the chat box here with any questions, because unfortunately, we have run out of time. And I want to uh, respect everybody's uh, schedule. So yes, uh, Matt has just posted um, our archive of uh, Lunch and Learn um, webinars in the chat box as well. So you can go and look back at all of the recordings. So thank you very much again. And we look forward to seeing everybody again very soon. All right, bye all.